I just want to say, um, Dr. Alexander, thank you so much for being here. Thank you com for coming on the show. Well, thanks so much for having me on. It's a real joy to be with you today, and I look forward to our conversation. That's very kind, and uh, I'm sure you hear this every single day, thousands of times a day, but I personally had an experience where you totally changed my life, um, and I know you hear this all the time, uh, but I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for um, blessing us, for sharing your journey, your wisdom. Um, it was uh, so powerful. Just my listeners know me pretty well at this point. Uh, my grandma passed away about six years ago. I was very close with her, had mm -hmm. been partially raised by her. My parents had been divorced since I was a kid and she was always there. And I was so struck by how affected I was by her death. Oh, and yeah. one night I could not sleep and um, I prayed for her to send me some kind of a sign that she was okay. And she said, go on to YouTube, <laughs> which couldn't believe that, go on to YouTube and just uh, the next video you watch, um, you'll know that everything's okay. And, and you're going to hear my name in this video. And um, I don't know what that meant, but I found you. I had never heard you speak. I had heard of your book, but I actually didn't know your name, but I had heard of the book. I knew that uh -huh. there was this person who had gone on Oprah and told this story, but I didn't know it was you. And here I was in the middle of the night and you're telling this story. And sure enough, one of the people that you mentioned in the story has her name. Um, and I was like, oh, out of all the names in the world, of course. Um, and mm -hmm. then actually she said, and wait, you're going to hear your name too. So you'll know that this story is really for you and me. And then of course, somebody in your story had my name. Very and important like, person in my story. Yes. Who made it all come together. So it was, I can't even tell you. And then <laughs> I, and then there you were. And so I'll, I'll tell my, my, my listeners on a totally different episode more about that, but thank you for being who you are. And let's dive in. So but it's my pleasure. And thank you for sharing that because, uh, you know, for all the trials and tribulations of going public with my story and sharing it widely, uh, it's stories like yours of people who greatly benefited uh, from the book. And of course, your, your lovely grandmother from the other side was able to steer you in that right direction and give you the heads up about the names appearing just so you know, this is real. She's really there helping you. And that's one of the most beautiful things about this awakening is we realize our soul connections, loved ones who have left the physical plane are not gone. They are still part of our lives and can benefit us tremendously if we simply open our minds and kind of hear the message. So I'm glad you were open to hearing the message. Totally open. And the thing is that you're so loving and you're so clear that I think anyone who just is available, it just goes right in. You know, the Talmud says words from the heart speak to the heart and that's what you do. So well, thank you. I, I will confess that uh, people who have both read Proof of Heaven and listened to the audio book uh, in large numbers tell me they got much more out of the audio book. Now, the words are absolutely identical. But my voice conveys a lot of the emotional truth and power of the story. I mean, there were parts of it towards the end. I had to read three or four times uh, in the studio because I just broke down. My emotions were just. <clears throat> and so that's what people get out of the audio book. It's uh, that sharing from the heart that you're talking about. Of course, it also comes through in the book. No doubt about that. Uh, but the, the voice can carry so much of that heartfelt message. 100%. So I know that you have told that story one zillion times, um, but for anybody who, for whatever reason, didn't hear it, or even if they heard it, I, I do want to start there because it is the crux of sort of what puts you on this mission to now do everything you've been doing. And we'll get into that too. But would you mind telling us um, whatever version, however abbreviated of a version you feel like telling of that story, however long we're here for it. Just okay. remind us of a little bit of what happened to you, how this I all started. I will do exactly that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it is a fascinating story. And it's still, uh, to me, I, I never tire of sharing it. Uh, I will give a very brief encapsulated version here so that we can then have some discussion around it all. Important thing to point out is one of the atypical features of my near-death experience was that I was amnesic. I had no memories of Evan Alexander's life, no 
uh, language, no religious preconceptions, none of my scientific knowledge. Uh, you know, I was an empty slate going in. Now, in the early weeks and months of my recovery, you know, when my neuroscience knowledge was still not fully returned, I explained all that by saying, well, my doctors have told me how extensively damaged my neocortex was. And that was the part that was so shocking with documented damage to my, the part of my brain that would be most responsible uh, for any detailed conscious awareness was demonstrably offline. It was out of action. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the scientific community takes its story so seriously. And I found out later that, no, there was much more of the story than that. But initially, uh, amnesic for the uh, life before. And so what I went through were basically three different phases of uh, kind of the afterlife experience. The first was in a very primitive course, unresponsive realm. I called it the earthworm's eye view. Uh, you know, if I had just gone there and come back to this world, I would have had what's called a hellish NDE or a negative NDE. Uh, but no, <laughs> like most of us, I was granted far more in that journey. And I was rescued from that earthworm eye view by a slowly spinning white light that came packaged with a perfect musical melody. And it was by remembering the notes of that melody that I could conjure up that light portal uh, again and again through my journey because I would tumble between these various levels over time as I explained in the book, Proof of Heaven. Uh, but anyway, so the initial passage up from the earth where my view is into this brilliant ultra real gateway valley. Now it had many earth-like features, but it was much more like Plato's world of ideals. There was no sign of any death or decay. And I would say that's the realm where we reunite with higher souls, with our, with our higher soul, with our soul group, you know, loved ones who have left the physical plane already. Uh, that's where we plan next incarnations uh, go, and go through life review. That's the most important part because the life review, which has been talked about going back thousands of years, uh, is a beautiful example of how we're sharing the dream of the one mind and that the, our sense of here and now and sense of self blurs completely in those life reviews. We relive events in a very detailed fashion, um, but we do so uh, often in a way where we're experiencing it from the emotional perspective of those around us who are influenced by our very thoughts and actions. That's why the life review in many ways is like the golden rule written into the fabric of the universe. Treat others as you would like to be treated because the life review shows us very clearly that if we hurt others, we're hurting ourselves. Uh, now in that beautiful gateway valley, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing, millions of other butterflies, <laughs> uh, thousands of souls dancing in the meadow below. And I said there were souls between lives. And of course, those who've read Proof of Heaven will realize one of the most beautiful aspects at that point was my guardian angel, my spiritual companion on the butterfly wing. It was actually identifying her four months after awakening from coma that it was the oh my God moment about the reality of the whole journey. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's all there in Proof of Heaven. So it turns out that... Um, my first awareness of the divine was this soft summer breeze or what I call divine wind or a uh, God breath of God that blew through. And even though what I witnessed and how I described it could stay fairly similar, that was my awareness of the power of the divinity of that infinitely loving God force. And I can tell you after coming back from this coma, I realized that trivial little discussion as to whether you want to call that force God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit. Those are meaningless little human uh, uh, issues that have nothing to do with the grander power of the truth of that infinitely loving uh, healing force at the core of our very conscious awareness. And so what then happened was all the joy and festivities that I witnessed uh, in that valley, all the joy and merriment and children playing and dogs jumping, every bit of that was being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs of pure angelic beings. I called them in my writings weeks later, they were angelic choirs. And these chants and anthems and hymns would just thunder through my awareness, this uh, incredible sense of power and majesty and awe. And yet it was a spiritual home it felt like I had finally come home. That's one of the most beautiful things to stress with people. Uh, and, and the other important thing to point out is uh, you often hear these journeys are ineffable, indescribable by our earthly language. And that's because our modes of knowing in that realm are so much grander. You know, here, our physical body, our eyes, our ears, uh, our brains, every bit of it conspires to limit 
our sensory flow to this tiny little trickle that's involved in our survival in the here and now as physical beings. And yet we have far greater wisdom and access to information about the universe beyond that. And that's why so much of the work that I've done since, and this is the focus of our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, it was co-written with my uh, life partner, uh, Karen Newell, is all about meditation of helping people to get to these same levels by going within uh, layers of mind. At any rate, back to my journey, those angelic choirs provided yet another portal, a light portal up into this brilliant, uh, you know, core realm. Now, the core, uh, I, I witnessed as I ascended to these levels, all of four dimensional space time collapsing down, then all of that spiritual layer of the, of the gateway valley, as well as a different, different ordering of causality that I call deep time. Very important concept to explain that time flow in that realm is not identically matched to time flow in this realm. Uh, anyway, we can talk more about that later if you wish, but bottom line is in the core realm, all paradoxes, all of the dualities of this world, male, female, good, bad, dark, light, et cetera, everything's resolved into pure oneness in that level. And that's where I acknowledge the oneness of my very conscious awareness with that infinitely powerful and loving deity, that God force, and coming to see as many near-death experiencers describe that we're never separate from that. Now, I would cycle through these realms because they're in that sanctum, sanctorum of the divine and the core, uh, becoming one with God with a higher dimensional multiverse. There is a complex oversphere for teaching lessons. I would then tumble back down to that earth or my view. And it was by remembering the music, uh, the notes, uh, and these are notes that go far beyond any notes that could ever be put together in music in this world. Uh, but an idealized form of music, I, but by remembering all that, that enabled me to conjure up those portals again and again. But I was always told going into the core, you're not here to stay. You'll be going back. We'll teach you many things. Not in words, because nothing in that realm was words. It was pure conceptual flow. The words were only applied later when I was writing it all up. But there came a time when they, they weren't kidding, and I could no longer conjure up through remembering the musical notes, I couldn't get out of that uh, earthworm's eye view. To say I was sad at that point, that would be an understatement, but I also knew I could trust I would be taken care of. And that is in fact what unfolded. I remember my uh, some of the last things I saw before I came back to this world, circle of beings, thousands of them going off into the mists, heads bowed, murmuring, energy coming from them that was very reassuring, comforting, uh, just like I'd felt in those higher spiritual realms. But this now is coming from these beings in this lowest realm. And I realized I was being led back to something. That's when I saw the six faces that emerged. And Five of them were physically present in the ICU room the last 24 hours I was in coma. Therefore, they served as what are called veridical time anchors. Uh, and, and they showed that the coma journey happened between days one and four, one and five of my seven day coma. Very important points that in fact are made clear in the medical case report written by three doctors not involved in my care, but fascinated by my miraculous recovery that appeared in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in September, 2018 by Dr. Serbi Khanna, Bruce Grace and Lauren Moore. Uh, they uh, wrote the case report and were challenged by the peer reviewers of the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, this case is absurd. People this sick with meningitis don't have a full recovery. How do you explain it? And they said it's because he had a near-death experience that he was able to muster this extraordinary recovery. And that explanation was good enough for the scientific peer review editors. They published the case report. At any rate, I came back to this world at the very end of the journey because the last of those faces I saw was of my son Bond. 10 years old at the time. Now, of course, I didn't recognize him because my amnesia was still in full force, but that was the Sunday morning, day seven of coma. The doctors had estimated I went from 10% to 2% chance of survival, but with no chance of recovery. So they recommended that Sunday morning stopping antibiotics and just letting me go. Bond had been protected from the worst news during most of that week, but he heard this. And when he did, he ran down the hallway, pulled open my eyelids, one eye looking over there, one eye over there, neither pupil responding. Those of you in medicine know how bad that is. At any rate, I did not see him with my eyes. I didn't hear him with my ears, but somewhere very deep on my spiritual journey, that message got through. He was pleading with me, daddy, you're gonna be okay. Daddy, you're gonna be okay. I did not understand the words, but I fully sensed the connection. 
And in fact, to that point in the journey, I had thought this can all continue, it can cease, none of that matters. I was just enjoying the ride. But now I realized, oh my God, it absolutely matters. I had to come back for that other soul, uh, no matter what it took. And it was the hardest thing of the entire journey. It was the first time I truly felt fear uh, because now I knew it mattered. Uh, and I, was, uh, I willed myself back to this world. And uh, when I first woke up in that ICU room, I didn't even recognize my mother, my sisters, my sons at the bedside. All I knew was the journey I had just been on. But language, personal memories, all of that returned over days and weeks. By two months, everything was back. In fact, many indicators I came to realize showed my memories were more intact then than they had been before the coma. We talk about all of that in Living in a Mindful Universe, how memory is not stored in the brain, uh, how the materialist model of neuroscience is going away because it's false. Uh, and there are much richer models that can explain all this. And that's what my journey in the 13 years since my coma has been all about, is working with scientists around the world to come up with a much more full explanation and understanding of how these kind of things work. Oh my God. I mean, you guys are listening. You can't see me, but like, I just, you know, there's tears streaming down my face. I'm sure a lot of you listening feel very moved and touched by it. And um, it's extremely generous for you to keep sharing the story. I I'm sure it takes a lot out of you. You've had to, not had to, but you have shared it so, so, so many times. Um, and it's so moving. Just in case people listening don't know this, just to put even more context to this, um, Dr. Alexander is a, he, he's an academic neurosurgeon and you've both, you've both been there in the hospitals as well as researched it. Um, and so it's, it's all the more striking, right. To hear you sharing this. And I, and I, I just am curious, and I've heard you speak on this before, but for the listeners to understand before this happened, before this occurred, were you the type of person who would have given this merit, who would have really believed that this is a possibility, or were you more, you know, in, in sort of a, 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 I don't know, you know, sometimes people who, who work, you know, at Harvard Medical School are not so inclined to, to sort of just, you know, jump on the bandwagon. Well, uh, I can tell you that uh, before my coma, uh, I was kind of a card-toting, reductive, materialist neuroscientist. Uh, I had wanted to believe in the afterlife and God and all that. Now, my original beliefs came from my father, uh, my adoptive father, who was a world-renowned neurosurgeon. He was very scientific. Uh, he knew a lot about cosmology and physics, but he also had a strong faith in God. He had grown up, his father, a general surgeon, had taken him to the Presbyterian Church in Eastern Tennessee every Sunday of his life. I still have dad's uh, little pocket Bible that he took during World War II when he served in the Pacific Theater. Uh, he was there in New Guinea, the Philippines, and then up into Japan. And that little Bible was in his pocket the whole way. I've heard from many of his old soldier uh, colleagues. He was a, a combat surgeon in the Army Air Force. Uh, about how he took that little Bible out every night and read. <laughs> so he, he never had a conflict in his belief in God and prayer and his scientific knowledge. Like many who grew up in the 60s and 70s, I always knew science was a pathway to truth. But what I uh, failed to realize was the importance of so much of the evidence that consciousness is primordial in the universe. And much of that evidence actually starts from quantum physics. Even though many quantum physicists will tell you quantum physics has nothing to do with consciousness, that's just because they don't have, know enough about consciousness. But it absolutely uh, is part of the big package. But I was too confused by all that. So if, uh, you know, when I share stories like that in Proof of Heaven, and uh, my response to my patients at that time was a pat on the back, and I would not take away hope. But on the other hand, if they challenged me to explain it, I would say, well, the dying brain can play all kinds of tricks. That's basically what my doctors told me when I tried to share these extraordinary experiences that I had deep in coma, because they knew I couldn't have had any experience because they knew just how bad off my brain was. In fact, they couldn't understand how I was coming back to this world. Uh, but the reality is what I now know uh, and what I've attempted to share with my career and with my public speaking and presenting at scientific meetings, working with scientists around the world, 
is the fact that this understanding of the primacy of consciousness and the eternity of soul and the interrelatedness of our souls and uh, kind of the evolution of our free will to uh, guide this world to a higher level uh, through our connection with the universe is all absolutely unfolding. The bleak and paltry fiction of materialism that I used to believe before my coma, you know, it's birth to death, nothing more. The brain creates consciousness. We're just biological machines. In fact, in its extreme, that scientific materialism would promise you that you don't even have free will. They would say it's chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the brain. They give you an illusion of awareness, but it's all just they're following the laws of, of physics, chemistry, biology. There's no place in there for free will. And I would say that my journey has shown very clearly a quantum informed science of consciousness opens wide to the reality of free will that we have as individual beings. And that complete idiocy of no free will that emerges out of hardcore materialism is a dead end that doesn't take us anywhere towards the truth. And that's why this awakening uh, of humanity to this deep scientific truth of the primacy of consciousness, of our interconnectedness with each other, not just humans, but with all living beings. Uh, it's, it's all a phenomenal uh, uh, wake up call for this world at large. So the, sci the little scientific me before coma presented with this evidence would absolutely know the reality of it. Uh, important thing is it's no longer a question of whether you believe NDEs are real or reports of memories of past lives and children are real. We know scientifically from studying them, they're absolutely real. They're showing us something profound about human existence. Just because we don't understand the mechanism doesn't mean they're not real. But the days are over when, you know, some little uh, materialist, militant, atheist, a uh, scientist can stand on a soapbox and say this is all nonsense and everything because he hasn't reviewed the data. Uh, because when you review the data, uh, the truth of it comes out at you full force. And of course, uh, for those who are not aware, I would steer them to BigelowInstitute.org, uh, which is a collection of 29 winning essays from a contest held last year with $1.8 million in prize money. And uh, those 29 essayists all had more than five years experience uh, scientifically studying the question that was uh, presented to them. What is the best scientific evidence uh, for the continuation of consciousness beyond permanent bodily death? And those 29 essays are all right there at BigelowInstitute.org. Nobody has an excuse uh, any longer to be willfully ignorant of the data. The data is right there. And even if you just read the first place paper by Jeffrey Mishlov, you'll come away realizing all this talk of the afterlife and reincarnation has a true basis in reality. And we need to understand how it all works. Oh my gosh. It's like literal medicine to hear you talk. It really is. It's interesting because <laughs> you were in the field of medicine before and your words, because of your insight now, every word is medicine. Every word is like a pharmacy, the best pharmacy possible. It's, a, it's such a gift to have you in the world sharing this. Um, Deepak Chopra was here a few weeks ago and we were talking about what we really are. And he said, well, you can say I am Kathy Heller or you can just say I am. And the part of you that is I am is really who you are. And yes. it's it's really what I've been practicing, studying a little bit at the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA for two years, doing a week-long retreat with Joe Dispenza, John Kabat-Zinn, like really trying to learn how to stop, you know, putting so much focus on the 3D, right? right. Um, and so help us understand because in, and I want to go back because there's so many questions and I do want to talk about your sister and I want to talk about what happened after the coma. Um, but then I want to get into what you're doing in the most recent, you know, um, moments as you've been helping people to truly try to tap into this um, here, right in the present. Um, and so I definitely want to explore that with you. Um, but I also want to go back and, and talk about that. Let, let's go back before we, before we move forward, let's okay. talk about what happened with your sister so that people understand how this okay. became even more real after you came out of your healing journey. Well, I think the important thing to point out is, you know, when I woke up in that ICU room, like I said, all my memories from my life before were still not back. They did return very rapidly, hours, days, weeks. 
Um, but what I knew so extraordinarily was that journey I had just been through, what, that I describe uh, much more fully in Proof of Heaven. And uh, it was shocking to me. For one thing, it was way too real to be real. That's what I told my oldest son, Evan IV, who was majoring in neuroscience in college at the time, uh, when he came home. And he had been there when I was deep in coma, uh, rest, with rest of my family holding my hand 24 and 7, trying to link me to this world in some fashion. He had gone back to school after I started waking up. Um, and then when I got out of the hospital a few weeks later, he came home uh, overnight uh, from college. It was the day before Thanksgiving in 2008, and he gave me a big hug. And I remember he told me later, it was like there was this light shining within me, and I was much more fully present than I'd ever been before. And I remember telling him it was way too real to be real. That was the part I was sharing with my doctors was, oh my God. And they would pat me on the back. The dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. You know, they couldn't understand how I was even coming back to this world. But that was the beginning of the mystery. And I remember that beautiful guardian angel because she appeared every time I passed through that ultra real gateway valley. Um, and, and her comforting words to me, I think are the central message I was to bring back to this world. You are deeply cherished and loved forever. You have nothing to fear, you are cared for. Uh, and of course, as I uh, said in Proof of Heaven at the time, the other part of her message was you can do no wrong. I wish I'd expanded on that a little more in Proof of Heaven, because to me, it was clear by that point that I, I was seeing that the ambience of that realm is all one of peace and love and kindness, mercy and acceptance. Uh, and that the more we tend towards those kind of ambient features of that part of the universe, the more natural our lives unfold in a positive direction. But we do have that free will that we talked about a little while ago. So we can choose to do otherwise. And if we choose to mistreat others and not be kind and merciful and all of that, that's our choice. But we then find out in our life review by receiving all that, maybe that's not the best way to be. So uh, anyway, uh, but th that guardian angel was so important to me. And when I came back to this world and, and my son told me, don't read anything in the NDE literature, you need to go write down everything you can remember. And I wrote about 20,000 words over six weeks. And it was only then that I dove into the NDE literature. And oh my God, was I shocked. So many of the similarities, I could sense this kind of commonality of journey in these other accounts uh, coming from all kinds of different medical circumstances. And yet, giving us the same kind of spiritual output uh, in the way of the journey. And the more I read, the more I realized <clears throat> that that spiritual guide is somebody very important to you in life. I knew her so well. Her telepathically delivered message was right there in my heart of awareness, and yet I didn't know who she was. And that part was a big shock. In fact, if I had scripted this, first and foremost, my adoptive father would have been there. He had passed over four years before my coma. That's who I would have wanted to see. And in fact, I report in the book, Living in a Mindful Universe, how I finally did encounter the soul of my father about two and a half years after my coma. That has to do with uh, the whole other kind of big feature of my life, which is meditation. I use differential frequency brainwave entrainment to uh, sacredacoustics.com as your resource if you want to learn more about that. But differential frequency brainwave entrainment is a very powerful way to get into deep states of conscious awareness. And that's what I was just beginning to do uh, two and a half years post coma. And that's when I had that extraordinary uh, connection with my father. Uh, that had not been there. In fact, he told me he could not be apparent to me. He used that double entendre, that little joke, that he couldn't be apparent to me in the NDE, because if he had been, I would have been more tempted, in spite of the fact that I had a one in 10 million diagnosis of spontaneous E. coli meningitis in an adult. It almost always happens in newborns, almost never beyond age three months. Uh, and a one in a billion recovery, as that medical case report makes clear, my recovery was really unexpected. There is no precedent in the medical literature. In spite of those factors, if my father had been there, I might have been more tempted to just say, I guess you see who you want to see on the way out, and tended to think it was imagined by me. Uh, that's why it had to be this guardian angel. And of course, uh, 
Uh, I won't go into the full background of that story because I don't want to spoil it. It's, uh, for, it's a huge part of the ending of Proof of Heaven. But the bottom line for people is that uh, uh, it turns out I did have a deep and profound connection with that guardian angel on the butterfly wing. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that I was adopted. Uh, my adoption history. And in fact, my adoption was a huge part of my journey because in so many ways, being put up for adoption by my birth mother when I was 11 days old had left a smoking crater in the core of my existence about my self-worth and my ability to trust the universe and whether I was even worthy of love. I won't go into that in more detail. I discuss that in Proof of Heaven. Uh, but the bottom line is my NDE and meeting that beautiful guardian angel on the butterfly wing was a huge part of my coming to recognize the love the universe had for me in spite of that being uh, left behind by my birth mother when I was 11 days old. So yes, it helped to tie all the little loose ends together, helped me come away from a traumatic experience of meningoencephalitis that almost killed me uh, in a very powerful, positive and profound way that shows healing. And I would say that one of the deepest lessons for me is that any physical, mental, or emotional healing is ultimately spiritual. And when I say spiritual, I'm not just referring to some kind of religious quality, because for me, spirituality doesn't need any religion at all, even though some people can use religion for benefit in their spirituality. Um, but if you just say spirituality involves a sense of oneness, of connectedness with others, uh, that we're all in this together, which is deeply proven in the modern scientific study of consciousness. And the other ingredient is a sense of shared purpose and meaning in our lives. That's what spirituality means to me. Uh, meditation can be very deep and doesn't have to involve any kind of religious scripture uh, you know, from 2000 years ago. We can rely on modern human experience uh, and on personal journeys, but never forget that the true living is done here in these physical bodies in this physical universe. So all the beautiful gifts we can harvest by going within and, and crossing the veil, connecting with that one mind, with that God force of healing and wholeness, but we bring those back to this world. And this is where we do the living. And it's how we treat ourselves and others, how much we can bring that love of the universe. Just as Deepak Chopra said, we're sharing the one mind of the universe. We're all in this together. And that's one of the most profound lessons that through the false sense of separation that materialism preaches has misled us into this dark cul-de-sac where you really have to question homo sapiens. You know, sapiens means wise. Well, when I look around this world and see the warfare, the addiction to, to fossil fuels, the climate change, the corporate greed, uh, economic polarization, uh, I mean, there are many downsides of this modern world, political friction and polarization. It's all related to the false sense of separation that comes from a, a disproven uh, philosophical system of thought. Materialism, was left behind decades ago by many in the scientific community who were more wise about uh, quantum informed consciousness um, and the lessons that it's all trying to teach us. And this, these are all things that we go into great detail in in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe to weave the science and spirituality together. I believe there's no way to move forward without that synthesis uh, and kind of integration. Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly compelling and you really sound like Einstein, you know, like Einstein said that reality, albeit very persistent, the way we see reality with a small r, it's such an illusion because it it demands that you believe in separate separation, but that's the um, ego, right? And I've learned so much and I, and I want to go into your your new your newest book because um it was so fascinating what you said about how it's not even something you have to utilize the mind for, that there are levels of, of which we can experience different realms far beyond the mind. And, and, uh, and going on week-long meditation retreats and meditating for eight hours a day, I've had moments where I can sort of memorize certain feeling states where I just have this wide open awareness and, uh, and I, I do feel like I drop the addiction to being limited to this three-dimensional um, experience, this fictitious, and, and really there's so much suffering there because in that state of ego, in the separation, 
we also give ourselves this constant cortisol, right? And then the biology of the cells actually wires us into this like very unhealthy place, right? When I had Dan Butner here, who studied these blue zones, right? Um, he said, why, why are these people living into their hundreds? Because they're practicing meditation, which allows them to reduce the inflammation in the body because inflammation is often caused by cortisol. So you can almost see that by practicing focus on the 3D, the fight or flight, this is all that is. Uh, we actually make ourselves sick, right? And we can live in this world and this plane longer even when we open up the awareness. So tell us how you've been um, guiding people now through a practice of living this way in a mindful universe, living more mindfully. How can those of us listening start applying that? And what might be some of the benefits that we can glean if we can shift the perspective and the paradigm? Well, Kathy makes some excellent points, and it certainly it takes us right into the heart of healing and wholeness. That's what this discussion in so many ways is about, uh, coming into wholeness as we are as uh, spiritual beings, all interconnected in a spiritual universe. Um, and, and I would say it, it starts uh, with an acknowledgement uh, that there, there is kind of this mental layer of the universe. And this is something that certainly is comfortable territory. Uh, for those interested in quantum physics. Uh, there's a one-page essay in the scientific journal Nature back in 2005 by Richard Kahn Henry, who is a physicist at Johns Hopkins University, and it's entitled Mental Universe. But he makes it very clear in this one-page essay that right there at, the, at this moment of evolution of thought about quantum physics and the nature of the universe, that it's showing us that primarily this universe is mental and spiritual. Uh, it's not physical. Uh, and this is a, a huge theme of our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, obviously. Um, and in that book, we, uh, we explore along this idea of mind over matter. You know, what is this kind of top-down causality from the mental layer of the universe that we're talking about that sentient beings like humans have access to? And that's why our free will is such an important concept to elucidate. And we see this in healing. Uh, for example, placebo effect. Uh, you know, it's been used for more than six decades now, although it's been known to healers for thousands of years, that uh, our beliefs, thoughts, and attitudes can play a dominant role in our very ability to come into healing and wholeness in these lives. Any kind of physical, mental, mental or emotional healing is ultimately about that oneness and connection. Placebo effect is much more than just, uh, you know, a sugar pill fixing a headache. Uh, and you'll find big pharma, they can't stand placebo effect because right out of the gate, it represents about a 30% barrier that they have to overcome that they know exists because someone's beliefs can actually lead them towards healing. Uh, now, you can go beyond this, though. For example, if you go to noetic.org, the Institute of Noetic Sciences website, put in the search term spontaneous uh, remission. And you'll find a book there that they published back in the uh, mid 1990s that had more than 3,500 cases of people healing advanced cancers, infections, what have you, beyond any medical intervention. Uh, and then the analysis of the factors there are largely spiritual about the things that led them there. Uh, for example, Kelly Turner wrote a beautiful book called Radical Remission that was based on that noetic sciences database, where she simply addressed the thousand plus cases of cancer, uh, came up with nine different factors that were uh, contributing to healing in those people uh, beyond any medical intervention. And six of those were strongly spiritual, having to do with emotions, you know, with processing your negative emotions, with emphasizing positive emotions, with developing a more spiritual approach by going within, spending some time in prayer and meditation. Uh, these are all ways of kind of connecting to our higher soul. And when you come to realize so many of us think that we are that we identify with that running stream of thoughts in our head. But I love how Michael Singer puts it in his book, The Untethered Soul. He calls that running stream of thoughts in your head, the annoying roommate. And you know, I came to realize early on after my coma and meditation, that in so many ways, that ego mind, that linguistic voice in our head is a huge part of the problem. And of course, modern, rational, enlightened human beings use that little linguistic brain and ego mind to kind of work their way through the breadcrumbs trying to approach truth. 
but there are much richer ways to gain truth from the universe. Uh, for example, uh, Einstein used to float around on a sailboat looking up at the sky, just daydreaming in this hypnagogic state, and he would get some of his most brilliant insights uh, into physics. Likewise, Thomas Alva Edison, he had a way of getting into a hypnagogic state by getting very sleep deprived. He'd hold weights in his hands, and as he would fall off to sleep, his hands would drop, that would wake him up. Those little micro naps gave him a dose of hypnagogia that allowed him to come up with these brilliant concepts. So creativity is ultimately not following the breadcrumbs of that little voice in our head, uh, but actually opening our minds to great creative potential from the universe, which we can easily do in meditation, centering prayer, other modes of kind of putting that ego mind and voice into time out. And that's one of my biggest responsibilities in meditation is helping people get to the point where they let that ego voice state a request or an intention or a question at the beginning of a meditation, but then it goes into timeout and I can ride the sacred acoustics tones because that's where the universe starts to really communicate with me and give me solutions from a kind of a higher soul level. I'll remind people that that ego voice, uh, uh, often in addiction and alcoholism work, the ego would much rather see the host dead than itself dead. And you'll find that many therapists will then resort to a ritual sacrifice of the ego so it can be reborn in a healthier form. We all have the power to do that through meditation and centering prayer, where we go in acknowledging the little ego voice uh, is a little part of our wounded child uh, that recoils at the world and, and bangs its chest and does all kinds of things, can lead us into addictions and all kinds of uh, wrong thought patterns, but ultimately that's not who we are. And in meditation, we can come in touch with that higher soul, uh, traverse that veiling function of the brain into that primordial mind, that God force that so many have encountered uh, in deep NDEs and other spiritually transformative experiences. But what Karen and I teach in our workshops is you don't have to have an NDE that this can be cultivated, this kind of state of awareness, this suppression of that little ego voice is not who you are, but a uh, seeking of identification with a higher soul and a part that's much more connected to the higher good. All of us can do that in prayer and meditation. I would say it's pretty much universally accomplished in near-death experiences. They come back to this world wanting to help, having that higher vision for the, the higher good. Their little ego mind is no longer uh, as attached to all the things it used to be. Uh, their higher soul is more in power. Um, so there, there's plenty more to say about all that, but I'd like to give you room for questions. Oh my gosh, it's so powerful. And uh, what you talked about with these radical remissions, when I was at this Joe Dispenza, I've, I've been with him a few times and I went with him to his lab now at UCSD. And, you know, we, we've we seen the the studies of, of what's happened, you know, when people can get beyond the the constant addiction of the the thought that drips that cortisol that, that, that gives us a certain biological uh, imprint at that moment, right? We can literally change it. And he actually showed that in a, in a Petri dish that people, lay people, average people who had just been meditating for a few days in Palm Desert, not like monks who were sitting on some beautiful right. mountaintop, their blood plasma, once they were in a more coherent state, couldn't attach to the sars cov virus. And because right. of that, UCSD decided to say, like, let's really look at this. Like, why the heck is that? Because we can overcome so much, even our environment, whatever it is, cancer cells, whatever it is, when we are plugged in. And I, I can't believe that I actually saw that with my own eyes. Um, but it's, it's, it's even more compelling hearing you comment on this, because as much as I appreciate so much Joe Dispenza's work, and he is a chiropractor, you know, there's a part of my ego mind that's like, he's a chiropractor. And I'm looking at you and I'm like, this is a man who has the highest degrees from the best institutions in the country that science can give you. And he is, you know, corroborating saying, this makes sense to me. And here's all the reasons why. And we, I really ho hope that people hear it. My, my further question, which is just fascinating to me now that I've been witness to this and I have my own dance with my own ego is I notice how unwilling people are to set down their suffering. Because essentially what you just laid out, and I've been down this road in similar fashion, it puts an end to all problems. If you truly start identifying with who you actually are, which is this expansive, basically a connection to infinity itself, right? 
then really where's the problem? And it right. allows you to feel so good. And here's what the beautiful and yet tragic question is that I find in my own ego and in the world is people's unwillingness to feel good. Like if the cost of getting to where I want means I have to feel that good, I have to allow that in, which would then make me feel so good. I'd have to drop my addiction. It's like a cigarette right. to this part of me that somehow feels safer feeling separateness, feeling the ego, feeling bad. It's almost right. scary to con conceive. It's like, that makes me feel unsafe. That's how much, because that's what the ego does, by the way, it makes us feel a false right. sense of protection, right? It's constantly looking for danger. And right. you then you then get, you don't even realize it, but how can you like almost in a way help people trick their own ego into surrendering so that we can actually get to the place that's the most familiar, unfamiliar place, which is our truth. Do you know what I'm, well, do you know what I'm trying to say? Absolutely. And, and, and it's certainly one of the focal points of our teachings about meditation, uh, about going within, about using sacred acoustics differential frequency brainwave entrainment to get into very deep states of conscious awareness that pretty much by definition are, are of this primordial mind, this mind at large. And uh, so when I get to that point, my little ego mind has uh, basically gone into timeout uh, for the rest of the meditation. Uh, it, it's a beautiful, it's, it's like opening up uh, uh, to a form of lucid dreaming in a way. The universe starts to feed uh, tremendous information to me in terms of what I need to know in that moment to help me come into a greater understanding of how I can then uh, bring this kind of healing love, serve as a conduit of that love uh, for the world at large. Because ultimately, um, you know, the tools the ego has are fear and anxiety. Uh, and, and of course, the other thing that that level of, of, of reality does to us is it tends to suppress the wonder and wisdom of the natural world surrounding us because it's always looking for that threat. Uh, and that's why turning off that little ego voice and it's a fear and anxiety uh, is a great liberator for, for your higher soul. You know, there's recent work that's been done uh, using uh, various uh, plant medicines or psychedelic substances uh, like psilocybin, magic mushrooms, uh, LSD, DMT. Now, I do not recommend the casual use of these substances by anybody. I think it's important that they're being used for scientific study. And my own personal recommendation is it's a much better way to connect a higher soul and kind of duplicate NDEs through meditation than it is through these substances. But Interestingly, when you look at the scientific paper on these substances, uh, you'll find uh, they show us two very powerful things. One uh, is uh, psilocybin in 2012, and then LSD and, and DMT in more recent years, DMT, the active principle in ayahuasca, have been shown to turn the brain off. When you use functional MRI, magnetoencephalography, other techniques we have for looking at neural network uh, uh, activity, under the influence of such substances, you find that the main networks of the brain disengage. The whole thing kind of goes quiet. No part of the brain gets more active. So it's telling us very strongly in scientific terms that those phenomenal conscious states are not being caused by any increase in brain activity at all. It's the brain getting out of the way. So if we want to explain it, wow. we have to go beyond materialism. Uh, that's one important point. The other that's absolutely crucial in this discussion is that uh, some recent studies have shown that a single dose or maybe two doses of psilocybin, magic mushrooms, uh, in a therapeutic setting can lead to months or years of curing and healing of addictions, like severe addictions, like opiates, nicotine, uh, alcohol, et cetera, and also a, a debilitating uh, fear of death in terminal cancer patients. Uh, psilocybin, one or two doses can have a profound healing effect for those disorders. And I would say that we accomplish the same thing in meditation. I mean, there's a reason you don't have to keep taking the medicine every day. You only take it once or twice in a therapeutic setting that enables you to traverse that veil, connect to higher soul and come up with your own healing, because that's exactly what is happening in those kind of settings. And what I hope to prove, and we'll be doing some studies on this, I hope, 
is to compare meditation, uh, sacred acoustics inspire differential frequency brainwave entrainment, meditation head to head with those kind of uh, psilocybin experiences or what have you to show that it doesn't even take the substance at all, that it's just thinning the veil, getting more in touch with that higher soul that allows us to come into that kind of curing uh, and into wholeness uh, in our journeys. And these are the kind of things that people really need to know about because it greatly emphasizes their own power to heal. And when you realize that you can move through placebo effect to the spontaneous uh, remissions documented at that Noetic Science website and go all the way to near-death experiences that have profound, miraculous level healing that goes beyond any medical explanation, like my case, as the case report makes clear. Uh, also, the case of Anita Morjani, who's stage four lymphoma, disappeared after her NDE. Or Dr. Mary C. Neal, the orthopedic surgeon, who had an over 30-minute warm water drowning in Chile in a kayaking accident in the late 1990s, all of us benefited from profound healing that goes way beyond anything medical intervention could offer. How do we explain it? Through the power of mind over matter and these kind of spiritual connections. So the more people know about this and realize that these healings occur in a natural setting in this world, in this era, uh, the more they can start using meditation and centering prayer and other ways of connecting to that mind of the universe in the process of bringing their free will of their higher soul into their own existence. And that involves coming into wholeness, healing, coming into the soul we actually came here to be. Uh, and in many ways, this healing we talk about is not just of the individual or the ethnic group or the national group, but of all of humankind. When you look at uh, what I said earlier about uh, homo sapiens being not quite so wise based on what we see, but I would say the cure to that is for individual sentient beings to come more into alignment with our higher souls and with each other uh, in a love, kindness, compassion filled uh, approach to life. It's amazing. And it's fascinating because every time you, you you go into more detail and you share it, it really is astounding how much uh, emphasis we put on the material. And meanwhile, like matter never made anything. Energy creates matter, right? right? And it's just to think about, you know, who were you when you were created? You know, what happened? There was like this incredible electricity, this energy that creates you, right? right? And we put so much focus on the physical. And then, you know, you look at an atom, it's 99% of it is is wave, it's it's energy. There's only a tiny, tiny part of it that's right. particle, right? And so exactly. what the world is made of is not this three-dimensional thing. So it's important for God's sakes that we start talking about the 99% of what's actually right. happening that we're feeling in this vibration of this world. So for you to keep talking about the sacred acoustics, that makes also all the more sense. I want to learn about it. Um, I have two more questions. One is a further question about meditation, but before we go there, just because I don't want to make, I don't want to not ask you this because it's a more spiritual question. And it also has to do with what I, I'm just curious what you, what you, what your perspective is now that you've been through as much as you've been through. So for those of us who have lost people, right. And for those of us who the ego is is scared of, of of disintegrating, and this other part of us is is unfamiliar, um, and and we want to know what's going on over there. Tell us whatever you know, or whatever you can tell us about where our loved ones are, and are they, you know, are they okay, and are they somehow still connected to us? Well, I would say the most universal ingredient in kind of deathbed visions, after death communications, of. Uh, of terminal patient work and experience, one of the biggest lessons going back thousands of years across all belief systems, all continents, uh, is that our loved ones are there when we pass over. Uh, our loved ones welcome us. No one ever dies alone. Uh, in that sense, there's a profound sense that we connect. And this comes not just from near-death experiences and study of after-death communications, uh, and there are reports out there literally by the hundreds of thousands of those type events. But also just, for example, the work of Christopher Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R. He's a hospice doc in Buffalo, New York, recently wrote a beautiful book called Death is But a Dream. And he has no interest in the afterlife. But what he discusses is what happens when he's dealing with terminal patients, people at the end of life, what they go through in those final stages. And what he describes is identical to what you hear in near-death experiences, that the souls of our departed loved ones are there to welcome us. 
And what I've learned is that is actually an imprimatur that means it's real. Uh, for example, my own mother, when she passed in April of 2019 at age 99, that's my adoptive mother, um, uh, she uh, was unresponsive with a respiratory thing the last four days of her existence. So just in bed, not responding to anybody, except for one little moment there at 2.30 a.m., two nights before she passed, when she got up out of bed, woke her nurse up and said, call my children. My mother's here. My mother, she's really here. And uh, I know from my experience of talking with thousands of other people about these kind of events that that meant she was close to passing. And not only that, it was a real event. She wasn't imagining that. Uh, and I know that from my own experience and from thousands of others uh, all across the board, that that is what really means uh, this is a true event happening. Uh, in fact, I was at a medical meeting a few years ago where there was a discussion of terminal delusions, which is as people get close to the end of life, they can get very confused and it's tough to manage medically. Uh, but when I heard some of these descriptions in that medical meeting, I stood up and said, well, you know, some of these are actually cases of terminal lucidity or paradoxical lucidity, where you have someone who has been progressively demented over weeks or months, uh, but then at the very end, completely against any expectation of a materialist scientist who falsely believes the brain creates consciousness, they come back to life. They regain access to memories. They can be very communicative with loved ones there at the bedside. In fact, I have a, a terminal lucidity case in proof of heaven. And it happened to a friend of mine who happened to be the head of one of the top neurosurgical programs on earth. That's why I included it. He was very confused by his father witnessing of his grandmother, that would be the mother of the dying patient, appearing at his bedside in spirit form 65 years after she left the physical plane. Uh, and yet my friend was absolutely convinced of the reality of this apparition to his own father, who then passed on very peacefully with a smile on his face. And that is a, a very important thing. When I told him my story, he went, oh, my God, he got it, that that's why that mother apparition was so real to the father was because she was really there. And that's the thing we need to start understanding is these communications are because our soul connections with others do not end with the death of the physical body. Uh, and in fact, uh, our soulmates who have already crossed over can serve as great guides in meditation and in, in the ease, et cetera. They can give us tremendous uh, kind of information. Uh, they're a resource. Uh, and that's why I think we need to open our minds tremendously to this uh, kind of uh, grander view of who we are and how the important thing is really our interconnections with our fellow beings, with loved ones. And of course, I came to realize that some who I'd seen before my coma as my nemesis or enemy, in fact, were very near and dear soulmates. It's just that we were trying to teach each other especially wow. challenging lessons. Wow. So pray for your enemy because they might be one of your best allies in teaching you a deep uh, and tough lesson in this lifetime. Wow. All right. Last question is you keep talking about it and you make it so compelling, this idea of meditation. And so many people are already on board around the world that they want to. And so many people find it very intimidating and frustrating. So what is one or two pieces of, of sort of guidance that you could give us so that when we sit down and the mind does what it does, and it starts to get you know, racing and, and busy and starts to make us actually feel more stressed than we were five minutes before, what can we do to stay in it and then steer ourselves in the right direction? Well, as I said earlier, one of the things I often teach in, in workshops on meditation and on my talks, et cetera, is about that ego mind. And people need to start by acknowledging that the little voice in their head is not who they are. You're aware of that voice and your awareness is a tremendous clue as to the reality of who you are, but you are not identical to those thoughts. That was kind of a, a mistake that Rene Descartes made when he said, I think therefore I am. It was his awareness of the thoughts that meant he was there, not the fact that the thoughts existed in the first place. That awareness is absolutely extraordinary. And that's the piece you build on in meditation. So you can let that little ego mind state a request and intention, what have you going in, but then that's why having a powerful tool like sacred acoustics, differential frequency brainwave entrainment that actually uh, provides sounds that are processed in the lower brainstem. And that's where I think the big magic comes from. We discuss all of that in Living in a Mindful Universe. 
But other sounds you might have heard, uh, chants, anthems, hymns, et cetera, they're all processed up in very recently evolved circuits up in the uh, uh, temporal lobes. Um, you know, the last few million years would cover their evolution, but you have to go back 300 million years before mammals even walked this earth to get to the origins of the circuits in the lower brainstem that were hitting with differential frequency uh, brainwave entrainment. And, and those techniques were shown to be powerful in the late 20th century for out-of-body experiences and for remote viewing, for uh, the scientific uh, ability to discern information at a distance and across time uh, people might know of remote viewing as the psychic spy program, Stargate, things like that. There are many other forms of it. It's been used, for example, by Stefan Schwartz uh, in archaeological digs to great effect. So remote viewing has been very well proven. But uh, this is all about uh, kind of coming into that higher alignment uh, with that primordial mind. And that's what we're really talking about. Uh, and 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 then opening it up. So it's it's really in meditation, from my point of view, that state of non-self, uh, getting that ego mind just kind of out of the way and acknowledging that it is not who you truly are, and really exploring and adventuring into that awareness. Uh, and as I said, just as in lucid dreaming, if you have a powerful tool for meditation, it can open tremendous doors uh, of knowledge and of information, assimilation and integration uh, gifted from the universe based on intention uh, that uh, can be quite extraordinary. And it leads to a lot of healing and understanding. Uh, and from my point of view, that's one of the absolute keys to getting into meditation and then having it build into your life and contribute to your understanding of self and your relationship to the universe at large. Absolutely. It makes so much sense. I've done so many sound baths where I start to feel something in such a more powerful way. And I'm just picking up just little pieces of what you're saying and how I've connected them to, you know, utilizing vibration and sound even more so than just focusing on my breath. But I, I'm definitely excited to finish reading Living in Mindful Universe. I want everyone to read it. It should be required reading because you're right. It absolutely changes the way that we then live our life. You right. said before that we can you know, potentially have these loved ones, these soulmates as guides in meditation, should we call on them when we're meditating? Or is that us still seeing them in their ego form and they're no longer in that ego form, right? So it's well, like, how do we utilize them or how do we connect with them? Well, uh, uh, I describe how I did it in uh, Living in the Mind for the Universe in terms of that connection with my father. But very simply, it's just a kind of an understanding and a belief that all this is possible and an opening of our hearts. Uh, and uh, Karen, my partner, would stress how important it is. You don't do this cognitively. It's not all about right. thoughts in the head. You go at it with the heart. And so remember what it was like to be with that grandmother, uh, you know, when you were young and you would sit in her lap and just that smell the perfume or whatever it is, but feel it in your heart, feel that emotional connection. And that's what begins to open the doors because this is a tremendous journey of kind of deep soul connection, which is all about relationships and feelings and not so much about thoughts and kind of intellectual cognitive structure. Uh, and that's why it's important to really go into this kind of heart consciousness uh, sense. And um, Wow. For me, that's been an incredibly uh, powerful way to do it. Uh, and also, I will say that it doesn't happen every time. You have to be patient. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, I think on the other side, they can be quite busy with things and don't always at that moment uh, are available to me. So I've gotten used to being very patient, but I find that by just going really deep in my meditation and really letting go and learning to ride those sacred acoustics tones, uh, that the universe often kind of opens up to gifting me with new ways of seeing these new kind of relationships, uh, loved ones from even further back that I might not even have a direct memory of, but part of my bigger soul group, all of it starts to play into it. So it's a tremendous adventure. Uh, you know, in many ways, it's kind of like Tibetan dream work. Uh, that's what they do is they spend time working with people so that, in fact, when you actually leave your physical body at the time of death, you're very accustomed to this notion of your mind being free of your body and you can run with it or fly with it. Um, and, and that is an important uh, attribute of this kind of practice, because, you know, I have no fear of death. I know that from my NDE, but I know other people who have also gained, uh, you know, mastery over this notion of death being the final uh, and a deeper understanding of its continuity. 
um, through meditation. So um, go in there and go for it. And it leads to a tremendous amount of healing in your life. I think that's such a beautiful place to end because what you said about it's like really the heart consciousness, you know, so often, and I'm sure you get this question too, but for, for anyone who does anything, typically the question is, what am I supposed to do? And I come back more often now to who am I supposed to be? Right. And when you're really in this place where like your, your partner, she says, you know, believe in that it's possible. And then you, you're saying, open up your heart. It's just amazing from this place of not focusing on what the action is to do in this world, right. but how you need to open your heart, how much you just draw right to you. So God bless yeah. you. Thank you for being in the world. Thank you for doing everything you do. Um, you know, if every single person really heard this and so many people have, um, you know, we would not only change our own lives, but we would just so powerfully uh, heal ourselves, therefore heal our homes, heal our communities, and right. and therefore make a big impact in the world. So you're just- uh, we, can we can certainly heal this world. The whole metamorphosis and transformation of consciousness that I believe is the reason the universe exists is nothing more than individual sentient beings coming into a deeper understanding of their relationship with the universe and its overall purpose and meaning. Uh, and that is the gift of this kind of thinking and awareness. Thank you so much for having me on, Kathy. I appreciate it. Oh, God bless you. You're the best. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful rest of your week. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.